Good morning, everyone. Um, oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, my name is Gloria Gonzalez Cook. I'm the president of the GSHA Utah, Utah chapter, and I'm really happy this morning to have uh, be able to uh, greet our uh, guest speaker. Uh, and right now, we're greeting Capitan Rafael Chacon. And uh, but I am going to ask Manuel Romero to do a, a better introduction. So Manuel, you could go ahead. Okay, buenos dias. Good morning to everybody. And uh, thank you for being here. I want to introduce uh, an old colleague of mine uh, who will be given a lecture, just kind of an introduction, uh, Dr. Enrique La Madrid, whom I've known for many years. Uh, he will be presenting uh, on and taking on the character of Captain Rafael Chacon. And we'll be uh, spending some time with Captain Chacon. Uh, and then uh, We'll uh, follow up with some questions for Captain Chacon, followed by an introduction, uh, a more formal introduction of Dr. Enrique La Madrid. following that, and then we'll be able to ask questions of uh, Dr. Uh, Enrique La Madrid. So let me start off by first introducing Captain Rafael Chacon. Rafael Chacon was witness and participant in some of the most significant events in the formation of modern New Mexico. From April 24th, 1833 in Santa Fe to July 23rd, 1925 in Trinidad, Colorado, his life spanned the entire territorial period in New Mexico. In the turbulent and decisive times uh, between the U.S. military invasion in 1846 and statehood in 1912, the fundamental paradigm of contemporary social and cultural relations in New Mexico were forged. Chacon embraces the challenge and contradictions facing all of Nuevo Mexicanos, rose to action and recorded his reflections in one of the only native Hispano voices from the 19th century. During the Civil War, Chacon distinguished himself as captain of a company of Hispano volunteers who defeated the Union cause, who defended the Union cause at the Battle of Valverde and Glorieta to keep the despised Texan slavers out of New Mexico territory. He spent his personal fortune on horses for his men, expenses that the U.S. Army promised to reimburse but never did. Chacon saw the Nuevo Mexicano troops take the heaviest casualties, then got blamed for the defeat in Valverde an injustice that moved him to take up the pen defense in defense of his people. Chacon later served under Kit Carson in the final campaign against the Napoles without his frontiersman knowledge and his compassion for these nomads. The war could have been lo uh, longer and more devastating than it was. Afterwards, Chacon was promoted to the rank of major, an impressive accomplishment since he never mastered the English language. During the Mascalero Apache campaign, he dutifully but reluctantly commanded Force Stanton. After his military career, Chacon served several terms in the territorial legislature. Frustrated with the conflict, corruption, and intrigue of Santa Fe, he packed up his family and moved to the Hispano promised land of Southern Colorado. The social, the social and cultural subordination of Nuevo Mexicanos was a personal tragedy for Chacon and his family. But he forged adversity into triumph and helped redefine for a new century, a new country, what, is, what, it, would, what it would be to be Nuevo Mexicano. From the clash of cultures and nations, a new re re resilience is born. So I give you Captain Rafael Chacon. Muy buenos días a todos. Les doy un saludo, un saludo a la gente del futuro. I see some little fantasmas on my screen that look like people. And you may see me as a fantasma in a flickering screen as well. But bienvenidos de todos modos. Yo estoy ahorita en Las Vegas, Nuevo México. Es el sábado 26 de marzo, 1898. Tengo 65 años y estoy, como dije, a su servicio. I came down on the train last night from, uh, from Santísima Trinidad, Colorado, where I live with my family, because today is a meeting, is, a, is an important meeting by the, for the GAR. The GAR is the Grand Army of the Republic. Old veteranos like like me, who decades ago defended Nuevo Mexico from the Tejanos, 
And we are, are proud uh, servants of our nation. You've heard the Patria Chica, and we serve our Patria Chica, we also serve our Patria Grande. Estoy, uh, estoy aquí leyendo el, uh, el papel y hay cosas aquí que, que nos, nos molestan mucho, nos insultan mucho. Miren ustedes lo que dicen. This is the editorial. This is the editorial. Given the state of belligerence that exists between these great United States and the tyranny of Spain, it should behoove our New Mexican neighbors to refrain from using the language of their cruel forebears, the conquistadors, in public. To insist on speaking Spanish in these times of tribulation is a threat to freedom as we know it, an insult to public decency, and a stain on our sacred emblem of red, white, and blue. Remember the main. You're wondering why we're upset. You're wondering why we're in our uniforms. And, um, and that's, that's why. We have always defended our homeland, defended our union. And here we are getting criticized for being who we are. We have always served our country. Under several flags, we have served our country, and we are here today. We'll go down to the plaza, all of us, all of us viejitos in our uniforms, and we will greet the public, we will have our meeting, and we will make our, our voices heard. I want to take you back in time a little bit. Uh, you're wondering, you know, how did this, uh, how did this guy learn how to read? If he was born in 1833 and there were no schools until 1880, well, we learned how to read because that was our best defense. That was our best defense as a people. My, my father taught me this uh, very early on. I was impressed with his, uh, with his weapons, with his sword. That, uh, that he showed me those old, those old Mexicano swords. They all had, uh, they all had like dichos on them. And I remember his. It said, No me saques sin razón, no me envaines sin honor. Don't take me out without good reason. Don't put me back in my scabbard without honor. So, this is probably my, some of my first reading that I could do as a child. Back then, they, they, they had a sandbox. There, were not, there, were not a, there was no chalk. There, were no, there was no pizarrones. There were no little blackboards. We did everything with pebbles in the sand, with our matematica, with our reading, because uh, we knew how important it was. My father was a, was a judge for Gobernador Manuel Armijo. So, whenever, whenever I speak to the kids, uh, they, they love seeing the sword. Uh, the Union sword says, E pluribus unum. Out of many, we are one. And this afternoon, we will be reminding our vecinos of that very slogan that's, uh, that's on the money, it's on everything. It's on our swords as Union officers. So, uh, how am I talking to you today? Por la pluma, la pluma, armas y letras. So let me take you back to some of my earliest memories. Uh, I was born in, in 1833. I remember when the Tejanos invaded the Comanches, came into Santa Fe. They had been giving the army of the Texas Republic uh, hell all the way, all the way over. And we got advance word and they the entire army was captured over near Villanueva, over, uh, out there between uh, Villanueva and San Miguel without a shot, without a shot, and they were marched to Mexico City. And they never asked us, the Tejanos never asked us if we wanted to be Santa Fe County, 
They never asked us, so they came to take over and we would not let them. I'm a bit of a folklorist, I, I love music, and uh, I remember this decima, not all of it, not all of it, but I remember my father and his friends uh, singing it. This is the victory song uh, about the Tejanos. Let me sing it for you. If you'd like to sing along, uh, please join me. Your voice can't be any worse than mine. Aquí vamos, Tejanos vencidos. Cuca México pasó con su escuadra la Tejana a reclamar a Santana las tierras que le vendió. Pero Armijo no entregó lo que ellos venían cobrando, pelotazos les fue dando a todos esos señores. Vengan otros cobradores que aquí está Armijo pagando. Leyes y constitución traían para sistemar y la esclavitud plantar era toda su intención ellos reclaman unión we knew what they were up to we knew what they were up to and as a child uh, I saw them marching into Santa Fe I was very young and by the time I was uh, 12 years old my father uh, packed me up and sent me to Colegio Militar Chapultepec to, to continue my education. Uh, my mother sewed silver dollars into my blankets, uh, in, into these Navajo rugs. And before too long, the, the cadets uh, realized how heavy my blankets were. And they taught me these uh, gambling games. I had never played cards. It wasn't too long before I lost everything and my officer let me live in his house because he knew, he knew that my father was a judge. So one day, I, I was there less than a year, one day a writer came from Santa Fe and, and said, Rafael, pack everything up. Ahí vamos al norte, ahí vienen los americanos. And so uh, I took, they knew I was uh, knowledgeable by that, that point. I had Learn my mathematics, and how many you know what trigonometria is all about? Trigonometry is to calculate the, the, the arc of projectiles on the battlefield. So I was a, in charge at 13 years old. I was in charge of my own artillery crew at Apache Pass, waiting for the Americanos to come in. Yeah, I vinieron. I vinieron. Pero, uh, the, there had been so much bloodshed in the Chimayo War of 1837. Uh, no one thought it was worth shedding any more blood in, in Nuevo Mexico. And uh, besides, all the ricos had their fortunas invested in Chihuahua by then. So the Americanos came in. Um, General Armijo told us to go home, to face them in peace. But uh, guess what? It was, wasn't very peaceful. I went back with my family to Chamisal. That's where, that's where our house was. And in these canyons that you see looking down from Embudo Mesa, looking east towards, uh, towards Chamisal and towards Peñasco up to the left, we were so terrified that we camped out there. I was 13 years old. We camped out there with everything we had. Uh, we were too afraid to, to build fires in the daytime because of the smoke. Uh, we built them at night. If the dogs uh, barked, we put muzzles around them. Uh, if they kept on barking, we had to sacrifice them. The burros, uh, we, just, we just gave them a good bosal. We just tied up their snouts uh, to shut them up because if the army, if the army had, had gone up one of these canyons, they could have captured all of us, all of us. So this is um, a campaign of, uh, of Sangre y Fuego. That's when they went up to Taos and, uh, and took over. Um, they were upset at the Nuevo Mexicanos. They were burning crops. They were, they were practicing with their howitzers on, on our houses. They, they had never been tried out on a, a houses. So uh, 
They eat their muertos, and these are not soldiers. They're just farmers and their sons. Sesenta heridos. And every place where there's where someone died, you see una cruz cristiana. Una cruz cristiana. This one's kind of on its side. Uh, another one down here, uh, that's known, some people call it the wounded sacred heart, but it's actually a sacred Pueblo dragonfly from centuries before. But there are there are twenty there are twenty crosses on Black Mesa. Uh, we have no monument for these fallen. They were considered traitors, traidores, and all they were doing is defending their farms. Where is the highway sign for them? Where is the list with the honor uh, for the the names of the fallen? I ask you, the people of the future. So anyway, uh, the years go by. Uh, my dad went to Mora. He was a judge. Imagine him from Mora to to grow wheat and to grow uh, his garden. And he was he he said he would never work for the Americanos because they came here by force of arms, and they they even offered him a job. They knew he was a judge, but les dijo que no. So then, the problems with the Utahs uh, happen and. I understand that, that there's a territorio that's even named for the Utahs, and that I may even be seeing some fantasmas from Utah on my screen. Yo creo que son ustedes, ¿verdad? La gente del futuro. So I, I told my dad, I said, uh, there's, a, there's a poster on the plaza. They're asking for volunteers. Should I go? Is it a, uh, is, is it a traición? to Nuevo Mexico if, if I go? And he said, no, senor, no, senor. You were trained in the military and you need to defend Nuevo Mexico. So go up there and, and go up there, I did. And so uh, when I went up there, I fell in love with the Front Range. I, uh, I learned a lot and I became uh, an Indian trader. I became a rico, un rico. Todo el mundo, todos mis primos, Siempre me estaban pidiendo dinero porque yo, yo junté mucha riqueza con mi negocio. I would trade for everything. I would go up there, um, a typical expedition. I would uh, go get some of this stuff. A ver, a ver si saben ustedes lo que es esto. It's one of the secrets to my success. Uh, who can identify this? Uh, when I... When I see people in person, the person that identifies it gets to keep it. But how do I share it with you? Who can identify this? Es muy dulce. Es muy dulce. And the kids in Trinidad, the, even the kids in Las Vegas, know that I have my pockets full of this stuff. Anybody know? I think I heard someone say piloncillo. Es el piloncillo. By the time it gets this far north, from uh, from uh, Chihuahua, from Ciudad Juarez, it becomes very, very expensive. And I would trade, I had a couple of trades where I, I would trade uh, a pound of piloncillo for a horse. The, the Comanches loved it so much. I would, uh, anyway, I traded horses to Fort Union. I, I made so much money that uh, I, like I said, I, I wanted to make more. I wanted to make more. We went out and brought in the buffalo, me and my primos, the, all of the carne seca. Uh, we, uh, one time I traded some piloncillo for 30 pounds of coffee beans, of green coffee beans that these Arapahos had. And I, I asked them, ¿Qué, ¿Qué están haciendo ustedes con café? Con café. They, they, they were boiling it like beans. And I traded it straight across for pinto beans, and I took it to Santa Fe, and and in Santa Fe it was very valuable. Uh, it was five, at least five dollars a pound. So uh, con todo ese dinero que junté, uh, I had a lot of uh, I had a lot of friends. Let's say. So um, I asked my dad. I, uh, we were reading reading the papers. We read them as often as we could get them, and. Uh, one day, my dad said, you know, uh, 
Parece que vienen los tejanos. Ahí vienen los tejanos otra vez. And do you see, do you see many negros in Nuevo México? Muy pocos, muy pocos. So who's going to be their next slaves? Si no nosotros mismos. So um, you get down there to Fort Union. Uh, call up all your primos. Uh, uh, get all your friends and go down to Fort Union. And so I did. They gave us uniforms. They gave us tents. They gave us weapons. Uh, they wanted us to march around like a bunch of uh, peones. But we are caballeros. And uh, I insisted on getting uh, horses for all of my men. And they're not cheap. Those horses cost me about $100 a head uh, to equip my men if they didn't have horses. Uh, someday, maybe the army will repay me, but uh, we did our duty. New Mexico was half and half. Uh, los federales en el norte, uh, los traidores en el sur, los negreros en el sur. And we didn't even call it the Civil War. We called it La Guerra de Glorieta, La Guerra de Valverde. La primera batalla fue la, 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 la batalla de Valverde, no tan lejos de, de Socorro, entre Socorro y la Mesía, y la, la, la Guerra de Glorieta al este de Santa Fe. My men proudly participated in both of these struggles. Ahí está Valverde. Um, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe what they, what our officers were telling the newspapers about us. Did they think we could not read? Uh, they blamed the defeat, because it was a defeat, uh, on the Mexicano troops. The, the, the language of this battlefield was, was Spanish. The, the, the officers uh, didn't have much respect for us, except for mi coronel, Kit Carson, SSC. When they tried to take our horses away, guess who came to our rescue? Mi coronel. He said, you take the, you take the horses from the Nuevo Mexicanos, and uh, it's not going to be a good day. And the companies that lost their horses took the greatest casualties. Not my men. We, would, we rode through the bosque. We, we tried to protect our, our cannons. And um, anyway, the, the Tejanos went around Fort, uh, uh, Fort Craig and went up to Albuquerque and then Santa Fe and then the other battle in Glorieta. And if it hadn't been for the Paikes Piques, uh, the Colorado volunteers, uh, this, would, this struggle would have been uh, very hard. But we had to stop these Tejanos. They were after the gold. They wanted the gold, and we had to stop them, and we did stop them. It was a draw. It was a draw. Uh, we had as many guns as they did, but uh, we destroyed all of their wagons, and we didn't get credit for that either. Uh, look what the newspapers kept writing. Um, here's another editorial. It, this one's trying to be funny, which is worse. Too little cannot be said of the valor of the New Mexican or too much of their inefficiency. Before the insidious advances of the tortilla, they were invincible. The red hot Chile Colorado had no terrors for them, but anything indigestible such as grape shot, unfermented, they retired with a stampede equaled only by a break of terrified buffalo. There may be no mistake as to the romantic notion that merit that very much of the valiant blood of the Hidalgos flows in the veins of the average New Mexican? Por favor, por favor. We bled and we died for this country. And how can these, uh, how can these Federalists be talking about this in this way? Um, notice my, my, there are other words I could put this in, but uh, I'm a gentleman and I, I, I will not tell them the words that they deserve. They got their own, uh, they came down in history for those for th their own uh, their own uh, uh, worth. Ese, ese general was the coronel general. I think it was General Chivington. Chivington, his great victory at Sand Creek. He he killed hundreds of 
of, of old men and women and children, and it was a great victory. Por favor, this guy was a preacher. Uh, who was left to preach to? That's me pregunta. They, they uh, como les digo, Carson was the only one. I, I vienen los paikes piques, uh, como les dije, y we could tell that they, that the Tejanos didn't have very good uniforms. When they would capture us, they'd take away our our, our uh, uniforms, and they would use they would use our belt buckles, but they would turn them upside down, and and. In the in the in the burials, a lot of the a lot of the dead were just buried right there. But over by Pecos, they found they found a man was was uh, was making a room on his house and found a bunch of guys buried with uh, with belts that looked like this. You know what you know what this looks like? It up here it's United States, but down here they kept these valuable buckles because to them it was Southern nation. No pasarán, que mueran los tejanos. Y ahora, ahora qué? What are we going to do now? Uh, Uncle Sam, we know, what, we know what's on his mind. And, and, and they're, they're telling us to, <coughs> to go fight Spain in, uh, in, in Puerto Rico, in Cuba. And this is not looking good. The, the main was sunk. And I really don't think why would Spain make such a provocation when they don't even have a navy to speak of? The navy is so decrepit. Uh, so Theodore Roosevelt uh, uh, came in with uh, with a brand new navy, and in in three months, in three months, the war was uh, was won. Except I'm jumping ahead in time. We're going back and forth in time. I'm worried because the war hasn't started yet, right? It's uh, the war starts in uh, in mid-April, but uh, but uh, we all know what happened, and I'm I'm very I'm very concerned for my country. Um, why should we want Filipinas? The the people in Filipinas have almost won their victory already. Uh, are we the new lords of of uh, Filipinas? I predict that there will be great great problems in Filipinas. I predict that uh, other wars will come in the future uh, because that part of the world is is in such a mess uh, they've been denied their freedom and they're not going to stop until they have their freedom and, and Cuba and Puerto Rico uh, the the patriots there have almost won that war have almost won that war and why do we want to go down there I know I know Matias Samuel I know how he thinks because his sister his sister's Su hermana se llama Destino Manifiesto. We saw a picture of her uh, ahorita. But I know what's on his mind. He wants to be, he wants Washington to be the new Madrid. And he wants to start another empire on top of the old empire. And he'll probably get away with it. But uh, why, why are his countrymen uh, treating us with such disrespect? No entiendo, no entiendo. So, ahí vamos. Look what our poets, look what our poetas are doing. Um, uh, todas las semanas, el independiente, especialmente en Las Vegas, el Nuevo Mexicano, en Santa Fe. Uh, this this time between the main and between the end of the war uh, produced a lot of of songs, a lot of uh, uh, coplas y versos. Uh, look at this one. Look at this one from the paper. Uh, Magnifico astro de imperio que con tu luz iluminas el lobrego cautiverio de Cuba y las Filipinas. So, um, we're we're patriotic. We're patriotic. Uh, we support this country. Um, but then here's the other side of the coin, and I'll leave you with this today. A nuestro pueblo nativo le acusan de ser canalla. 
pero no ha demostrado serlo en el campo de batalla. We know how we behaved on the battlefield, and we know how we, how without us, the, the rebels would have just gone all the way up to California. They've made it to, Calif uh, to Colorado. They made it to California. They would have had that gold. Uh, ¿Quién sabe lo que hubiera pasado si no fuera por nosotros? Okay, so, uh, uh, saludo a, a la gente otra vez y a ver si tienen preguntas para el capitán. Any questions for capitán? Rafael Chacón, I'll do my best. Uh, no soy más que un pobre viejito y me, mi memoria está fallando, pero uh, soy buen escritor y es, estoy escribiendo mucho también. Uh, let me, I haven't shared my own writing. Let me read a, let me read a little bit about uh, my own defensa of my gente. This is, uh, I wrote this in Spanish, but my son, my son translated it for me. He says, a sentiment of pride for my race makes me note a reflection on their martial character. Since the Spanish colonization, this nation of New Mexico endured an, an unequal struggle against the savage nations that surrounded it without rudiments, without resources, without assistance of any kind from the capitals of the ruling countries. We have fought and died always with the faith that it was necessary for us to defend our hearts, obliged by circumstances always to, def to defend us with weapons in, in the country and in the villages, like the Roman populace in primitive times We soon raised among our sons a populace of soldiers by nature intelligent, intrepid, valiant, and lovers of their country and of their liberty. The Nuevo Mexicanos, raised in the use of arms from their childhood, did not know what fear was, and God grant that those in whose hands our destiny has fallen will begin someday to appreciate our beautiful qualities and our temperaments. So, muchas gracias. Ahora la, las preguntas. Um, es una oportunidad para hablar con, yeah, con alguien yeah, del pasado. There's a, there's a question. Uh, it says you talked about your giveaway. I think it was the beeswax. The uh, what do you, I'm not sure what you call it. Uh, uh, they just want to know again what that was. Azúcar. It's azúcar. It's um, uh, it's raw. It's raw sugar. It's raw sugar. Uh, down south they call it panela, because it comes in big in big loaves. In big, they look like bread loaves. But the, the further and further north you get, the the more the less you get, and the price goes up and up and up and up. And people love it, not just because it's sweet. Uh, I have a recipe. Let me share it with you. Um, take some sweet grass. Take some uh, yerba buena. Take whatever kind of fruta that you have. Maybe some capulín seco, some albarcoque seco. Find a nice little ollita. Put some piloncillo in there with everything. Uh, put a cloth on top. Put it in a nice cool place. And come back in two days. And what do you have? A party, a party. It, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it's bubbly, it, uh, it tastes wonderful, and alcohol really gets your conversations going. And I predict, I pre predict that great fortunes will be made in the future with, uh, with, with uh, alcohol, and that's why people wanted this so badly. But it, it is azúcar, sugar. Gracias. Okay, I, I do have a question for you, Captain Madrid, or Captain, I'm sorry, Captain uh, Chacon. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Um, so, um, I, I've done some research, and uh, it, though it's not definitive, uh, it appears that we have my great-grandfather, Nicolás Romero, fought under the command of Rafael Chacon. How would I be able to find if this is the case or if this is true, uh, where I could uh, basically, well, uh, research that and find out if in fact, 
Nicolas Romero fought under the command of Rafael Chacon. Yeah, fácil, fácil. Uh, get a copy of this book. You can still get them on um, on the secondary mercado. And I put in mis listas. Everybody, every single person I saved, I, I, I served with, all of my gente, all of Compañía que Primer Regimiento de Voluntarios en Nuevo México, sus nombres están ahí. So, gracias por la pregunta. Otra. I have a question for Dr. Lambadrid. Oh, hang on, hang on. Hang on. I, if, uh, while, while we're doing this transition, let me uh, introduce Dr. La Madrid to the audience so they know who he is because we're, we're transitioning from the character. We're transitioning from the character of uh, uh, Capitan Chacon to Dr. Enrique La Madrid. Uh, Dr. La Madrid and I go back uh, several decades. Uh, Enrique was born in Embudo, New Mexico, and grew up in Santa Fe and in Albuquerque, where he lives. He is an editor, historian, and folklorist. Uh, critic, translator, and distinguished professor emeritus of Spanish at the University of New Mexico. He has he was he has written Hermanitos uh, Camanchitos, Indio Hispano Rituals and Captivity and Re Redemption, Amadito and the Hero Children, about the pandemic of 1918 and La Seca de Juan that also amongst others. And uh, if you if you might be familiar with uh, Dr. La Madrid, he is the one that wrote the foreword in my book, Mi America: The Evolution of American Family. So. Uh, that's where you might uh, recognize his name. So now uh, let's introduce and uh, welcome Dr. Enrique La Madrid. Glad to meet you. Yeah. I have a question. I have a question for Dr. La Madrid. Yes. Uh, when Texas got its independence from Mexico in 1836, after defeating the Mexican army of General Santa Ana, uh, what I wanted to know was uh, that that 1836 map of Texas. They were claiming as their territory all the way into New Mexico, Colorado, and Oklahoma. When yeah. you, when the other person started speaking, you said, or I think you said, that they might have bought some of that uh, territory from Mexico. Is that what you said? That they uh, that the Texas bought territory from Mexico? It. Uh... Texas uh, won its territories in in the war with uh, with Santana. Uh, they they captured him. Uh, he gave them everything they wanted, and uh, they uh, they were they were big thinkers. Those Tejanos, uh, Sam Houston, when, when they were when they were making their maps, uh, the the first maps they were making of Texas showed the western border as California, as California, and so. Uh, Sam Houston himself uh, had to say, uh, hang on, hang on, boys, hang on. You know, uh, we could never control that much territory. Uh, the, look, look how much they, they, they put on their map. And, uh, and so it, uh, uh, there were plenty of people in Nuevo Mexico, and they never asked us if we wanted to be on their map. That was, uh, that was the problem. The part that was bought from the United States goes from, uh, uh, let's see, there's another map of this uh, that'll show you. Um, whoops. It's the, uh, it'll show you where the, there it is. Um, since this is Confederate territory, the idea was, um, you know, we we want this. We, we want to take this from New Mexico to, to to make this part of the Confederacy, uh, at that point in time, they were trying to get the state of Sonora as a as a state to get two senators uh, to vote in Washington. They tried to they tried to do the same in Nicaragua because uh, Nuevo Mexico. They, they figure, well, here's pieces of Latin America that we can bring in. Uh, the thing the Cubanos today will never tell you is that they wanted to be a state. They wanted to be a state. <clears throat> this time before the Civil War, because they were outnumbered um, nine to one by their own slaves, <clears throat> and they saw what happened in uh, in IP with the slave uh, rebellion. They didn't want to want it to happen in Cuba, 
And they said, please make us a state. Please make us a state because they knew they would get uh, military protection. So the part that, that this gray part that goes all the way down here, <coughs> that's what it is, the Gadsden Purchase. And it goes all the way, it goes all the way to California. And the reason they wanted it is because all the other train routes had snow. And this was the only, and, and today it's, it's called the Southern Pacific still. Uh, it took them a while to build it because they, uh, for a while they had to punish uh, San Diego for being uh, rebel sympathizers. But eventually it was built and it was built because of this uh, Gadsden purchase. And uh, uh, it's interesting, the historians tell us that, that uh, it was purchased, but actually not a penny exchanged hands that I know of. Uh, they said, well, you owe us all this money because uh, that's war reparations and we're just going to take this. And so uh, that, that was added on, that was added on clear to California at that point in time. So, otra pregunta. No. This is Gloria. Um, yeah. I think prior to the... Um, the Texas Republic being formed, that territory was called Sonora. So the whole territory was called Sonora. Um, um, actually, Texas is an, is an old name, and uh, so is uh, Nuevo Mexico. It sounds like it's new, but it's actually a very old name, as is uh, the area of, of Texas. Um, the, in some of the oldest maps, um, like in, in the 16th century, uh, they were hoping that the, that, the, that the Sea of Cortez was gonna be a whole lot closer than it really was. Oñate brought ship's carpenters because he thought he could just go down here and, and he actually founded New Mexico's port city, which is called El Puerto de la Conversión de San Pedro, and, and, or San Pablo, I mean. And, and so uh, what happened in the 1840s is, is the real Sonora and Baja California there was a filibuster named uh, William Walker. He was the guy that, uh, that conquered it. Most of his men died in the desert, but he, 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 uh, he applied to uh, Washington, D.C. to uh, become president of the Republic of except uh, uh, his army died on the way. And so then later on, he ended up in Nicaragua, and he won in Nicaragua and declared himself uh, Presidente, and the, after the, 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 the poor Nicaragüenses, they abolished slavery in 1821, and here comes an Americano in the 1840s, and the first thing he does is reestablish the slave trade. And what kind of, an, what kind of introduction is that to our paisanos, right? So uh, he failed miserably there too, gracias a Dios, but that's, that's the original meaning, meaning for filibusteros. But to my knowledge, you can, uh, we, I'm not a historian, but, uh, uh, we can find one, and uh, Sonora is uh, is kind of connected, is joined at the hip with Arizona, and uh, and the uh, Tejas Tejas is joined at the hip with uh, Coahuila, and it had old names like uh, Nuevo Santander along the river, and, and Nuevo León, which is still being used, and Nuevo Mexico, which is still in use. But great, great question, Gloria. Uh, there's there's a couple of questions in the chat feature which I'll, I'll reach for you and read. Okay. One is from Priscilla. Did Capitan Chacon fight in the Belverde battle? He did. He did, and his he was very proud that his uh, that his cavalry they they weren't officially cavalry but they 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 were the first ones to get down to the bosque and to get down to the river. And they were the, at the beginning of the day, and they were the last ones out of there. And they performed really well, really well. And he was, he was very proud of that. And that, that's why he got so upset when he read the uh, Shivington and Canby's uh, reports of the battle. They, he, he just said, you think we're a bunch of illiterates? You know, uh, all, of, all of Chacon's kids became newspaper editors and novelists and great poets. And everybody knew how to read. He taught his own kids how to read because there were no schools except the kitchen table. 
And so uh, that's a, a very proud uh, tradition in our in our part of the world. And the, and and I'm not talking the state of New Mexico. I'm talking all of us. I'm talking uh, Colorado, uh, uh, Utah. Uh, I guess you could call it Greater New Mexico. The way Américo Paredes talks about uh, uh, Greater Mexico, wherever there's Mexicanos, uh, that's part of Greater Mexico. And wherever there's Nuevo Mexicanos, I, I'm starting to call it uh, uh, con su permiso, uh, uh, Greater New Mexico, because um, most all of you in Utah have, uh, have uh, uh, primos and parientes in, uh, in, uh, in Nuevo Mexico. And, Probably some are, some of you are from somewhere else, but uh, but uh, a majority. Miguel uh, Manuel was telling me there's a lot of there's a lot of folks up there, and you're the core, you're the core group of activistas and and people interested in cultura and historia. So congratulations on all those fronts. I'm I'm very glad to uh, to talk to you. I'm I'm glad this worked out with no glitches and with no. Uh, yeah, no there's, there's, a, there's another question from Catherine Pacheco. Sí. Where can I find the genealogy of Capitan Rafael Chacon? Oh, um, I think it's online. I think it's online. His, uh, his family is very good at this. And his, the person that I know has it is, uh, is, is the wife of... Um, the retired, uh, the first uh, director of the Albuquerque Museum, Jim Moore, um, Peggy. I can't remember her her uh, her last name because she was uh, she's a coyota, but uh, her her uh, her ancestors are, are from the village of Chacon. Um, Rafael Chacon had two families. He had two families. He had one up in in uh, Trinidad, Colorado. And uh, and he and he had one in Chacon, and he taught all of them how to read, and he he taught uh, he supported all of them to the best of his abilities, and and he he came, he was a bigamist, I guess you could say, maybe maybe he should have gone to Utah, but uh, sorry, couldn't resist, but uh, 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 the uh, but Peggy, my friend Peggy, is related to the to the Sweethearts family, to the, the, the people in the village of Chacon, named for the Chacon family. And she's got that complete genealogy, and I can, I'd can i be glad to uh, to leave you her, uh, her uh, email address. Maybe she has it on a single piece of paper. Let me, uh, if you wanna hang on and I can write it down for you. Uh, uh, we'll, you can send it to us and, and, and we can send it, I guess. I yeah, it's it's one. It, they they're both. Uh, yeah, I think you can send it to us. I have one quick question for Doctor La Madrid. Well, it looks like uh, it looks like he he hit the ex exit button. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Accidentally. Um, well, let me ask my question and maybe somebody else can answer it. How soon after Texas became a United State state did it take the shape that it has now? That's my question. I think Texas became a United States state in uh, 1845, I believe. Yeah, I'm not sure. How long were they a republic? I mean, they became a republic between what, 18, between 18 between 1836, and when they became a state in a uh, United States state in 1845. So, what what is that? 15 years? 13 years? Yeah. There's Dr. La but, Madrid. But but what I would like to know is when did Texas get the shape that it has now? Um, Are you back? I'm back. Uh, for, I got bumped sure. for some reason. Uh, okay. Not, not by angry uh, high school students or whoever they were. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, how long has uh, 
I think I heard the I heard the correct answer. I heard the correct answer. Uh, it didn't. It wasn't that many years, and they decided it it was better to be a state than a repub than a, a republic. So did, that make uh, so did it take the shape that it has now when it became a state in eighteen forty five? I believe. Uh, yes, it did. Okay. To my knowledge and and. And the, the reason that, that uh, you know, El Paso is really New Mexico, historically, uh, except for what the Tejanos did, and they, they, just, they just held on to that little piece and put it in there way in the, way in the West Texas. So um, I, I haven't studied that, that history, how that happened, but if you compare the old map to, uh, uh, to the new map, uh, you'll see the, the similarities, uh, if you, you know, what's now Kansas, Oklahoma, Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico, look how, look how Texas juts out there and grabs, they couldn't have all of Santa Fe County, but they did grab El Paso del Norte. <clears throat> hey, we have a few more questions from Catherine yeah. again. Uh, sure. How did you come by the Chacon sword? Oh, um, the actual, uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, uh, it is a facsimile. Uh, it's, it, it was given to me by, by Jim Moore, the director of the Albuquerque Museum. And the, uh, everything else is, uh, you know, you can go online and, and I've, I've actually hung out a little bit with the, with the reenactors. I'm not a, I'm not a Civil War reenactor. Or anything like that, but sometimes I've been, I've given lectures like on uh, in February in 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 Pecos, for instance. Uh, there's there's a big gatherings of uh, reenactors there, but um, and actually there there is a bunch of reenactors that that actually speak as much Spanish as they can when they're doing what they're doing, and they know all of the terminology for all of the weapons and all of the. The drilling and stuff that they do, because uh, just to remind the the tourists that might come by, that uh, that the the language of the battlefield, um, uh, <clears throat> the battlefields were bilingual, and uh, uh, the and there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, New Mexico volunteers, and and uh, they were they were given their orders uh, in Spanish by their officers and by. The, the colonel that was in charge of all of them, who was Kit Carson, he, he spoke Spanish um, well. And they were very loyal to him. Um, and he made them, they, they were still, uh, they were in for three years. And so all of those, uh, all those soldiers ended up uh, in the Navajo campaigns after that. A lot of them went to, um, what's the name of that fort on the way to Tucson in the Chiricahua Mountains? You know, there were, they just kept going, and he has, he writes about all of that too. And and once I got invited to um, a Navajo school to talk about him, and actually, he he behaved pretty well. And uh, he he was uh, uh, attached to the Long Walk. He was uh, uh, watching over people in the Long Walk and the in the in the march to uh, uh, to to, uh, to Bosque Redondo. To Fort Sumner, and there were there were uh, people there, unscrupulous Navajos who were who were selling kids. You could go right up to the columns, and there were all these orphan kids, and people were buying them right and left. And he, boy, he he guarded them. He guarded them well, and he he took care of these uh, of these uh, of these Navajos that were trying to sell their own people. And he he writes all about this. And so the uh, when when I went to the this Navajo uh, high school, it was, it was great. They received me so well. I was terrified that they would start jumping all over me because of the long walk. But actually, um, uh, Chacon, the character, um, actually behaved uh, quite well uh, on the long walk. And he, he, he didn't agree with what they were doing. He said, this is, this is not going to work. And of course, it didn't. Yeah, there, there's there's a couple of questions about how we get a copy of the book, The Legacy of Honor. And if you go to the chat feature, Tom Martinez uh, has put in a link to where I guess you can get that book. Uh, 
It's from uh, Duke U Press, I, I guess. So if you go to the chat, you can click on that link and you can see how you can buy the book. And yeah. oh, Tom says it's uh, available for $55 from Abe Books. And there's another link there that he put. At the it's, end. It, it's worth it because the price is just going to go up. They did a second edition. Yun and Press did the first edition. The family of Jackie Makita did the second uh, edition. And uh, unfortunately, she died, then her husband died, and they took uh, many boxes of, of the second edition to the Las Cruces dump. And um, they, a lot of them were recycled and pulped. And, and a friend of mine in Las Cruces sent me a whole box that he found at the dump. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, these, these things are gonna be in libraries and there, there's a few copies out there. So I, I, would, uh, I would urge you to tell your librarians to, to, to get it. Abe Books is pretty good. It's much better than, than giving uh, Jeff Bezos any, any more Bezos from our, from our uh, uh, wallets. There we go. Okay. Well, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Enrique, and thank you, Manuel, for getting Enrique to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Now, uh, turn it over now to uh, Gloria. Uh, and again, thank you again, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor La Madrid. We really um, enjoyable and and very informative. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's a the the Chautauqua lectures are a really great tradition, and uh, it started in upstate New York, and people uh, got out of um, the city and they went up to the mountains, and they got bored, and they would all go up to Lake Chautauqua, right, and. Instead of getting a history lesson about uh, Abraham Lincoln, this big guy would walk in and with a big stovepipe hat, and he said, "Hi, I'm Abe." You know, and so I, I was. Uh, it's not an acting. It's not acting. Uh, and in fact, actors. Uh, we, I was. I was trained by uh, <clears throat> Cliff Jenkinson, a professor from uh, University of Nevada, who uh, he is the Thomas Jefferson. And uh, he, uh, uh, the first big Chautauqua I went to was in Greeley, Colorado. They had a big tent Chautauqua, just like the old days. Oh, very so, interesting. Yeah, so I encourage all of you, all of you to develop a character and get in touch with your, get in touch with your, uh, with your humanities council. And because a lot of these humanities councils, they don't have many Hispanic characters and uh, and they'll just keep bringing in Ben Franklin and, and all these other people, um, which is great, except there's a lot of local heroes and their, their stories need to be out there. And that's what happened to me. I got recruited because um, I was reading this guy. Um, he, uh, uh, he, he wrote down a lot of poetry and that's what I like. Decima, uh, uh, poesia, everything. So that's all in that book. So. Have fun with it, you guys. Have a good meeting. I know your meeting started just now. Uh, I'm, I'm one minute into it, so I, I will take uh, I will take my leave and have a good time. Uh, the uh, 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 Manuel will will give you updates on uh, t t to me about you guys and and uh, to you about me. So um, okay, thank okay, you very much for sharing that.